As mentioned on the last video, I will show you how I develop a basic exploit for the file upload vulnerability so we can easily get access to Castle Black using one command. Join me in this video to learn about basic Python scripting, threads, pawn tools, and ASP technologies. Before we start, do note that the exploit we will create will be very simple so that it can be easily understood. Advanced setup and programming best practices will not be the focus of this video. Let's go ahead and create a Python script. I will use Vim as my code editor as I'm more comfortable with this, but you can use anything you want. We will start by creating a shebang for Python 3. Shebang tells the operating system on where to find the compiler to use for your program. Since we will interact with the web service, I will import the request module. Python modules are pieces of code that can be reused to do certain functions. A module provides different methods which are the functionalities you can use. In this case, we want to use the post method since we will interact with a post form. Let's put our target URL into a variable. Then let's supply that into our post request. Since this is a post form, we need to also supply our post data. The data will consist mainly of our ASP reverse shell. So let's open that file using Python's built-in open function. Let's also use a variable for the actual file path then we need to tell Python that we will open it as a binary. I think this will work to mimic a post form attachment. And probably we need to invoke read method as well, but let's try. In order to help us debug any issues, let's pass our request through our BERT proxy. The format will be a dictionary containing the type of proxy, IP, and port. Python dictionaries are used to store data in key value pair format. Now we pass it to our post request similar with other parameters. Let's make all variable names uppercase so it's not confusing. We want to see the response, so we will get it via the text property of the request object and print it. I'll hit Command-D on my Mac to open up another pane at the bottom and fire this up. And there we hit our first error. When opening a file stream, we must tell Python what we want to do with it. Do we want to read, write, or append on an existing file? Or do we want to create a new file? In this case, we want to read an existing file, so let's put an R behind B. You see, encountering issues like this is really one of the best way to learn about things. Let's fire up again. Oops, another error. This time it's not a program error, but just silly error on a wrong file name. So let's quickly fix that. One more time. Now, this is becoming embarrassing. We forgot to call the name of the actual module. Hopefully we can make it through this time. We get a response, but let's verify if our upload is successful. Let's switch to burp. And let's find our HTTP request on the proxy history section. Our request can easily be seen as it is using a Python user agent. A user agent describes the browser or tool used to initiate the HTTP request. Going back, I don't think it uploaded the file as we should see a confirmation on the response. Let's figure out. We can try several things here. But the first ideal thing to do is to compare our HTTP request to a successful one that was done via a browser. I previously was able to capture a valid request which I sent to the repeater. It looks like we missed to specify the content type as multi-part form data. But what do you mean by that? A typical HTTP form allows you to enter different kind of information. The data you submit comes in different types. The web server needs to know the start and end of each piece of data. That is where the content disposition comes into play. It tells the web server what are the start and end of each data, as well as the type of data it will be expecting. I tried to pass the multi-part form data content type to our request, but then I realized Python request module can handle this better for us if we pass the file parameter. So let's do that instead of reinventing the wheel. As a prerequisite, we need to wrap our file data into a dictionary that contains the ID of the HTML button element. You can easily see that ID by inspecting the HTML page in the browser. Then let's replace the data parameter with files parameter. Lastly, let's remove the header since we no longer need it. Let's save the changes and fire up the script again. Let's see if this works now. We must see shell2.aspx uploaded to the site. Let me hit refresh. Still nothing. Let's go back to burp and check again the original request. It looks like we need to send these weird looking form data as well. I tried to copy them from the original request, but it didn't work. So I researched a bit and found out that these are view states which are used to maintain state between requests. 
These are added as hidden fields and serialized into base64 encoded string. Two of these values are dynamic, so we need to adjust our script to get their values. In order to fully accomplish that, we need to convert our HTTP request into an HTTP session. On our current setup, each request we made to the server will launch as separate sessions. That becomes problematic because it will create different view states for each request. We need to combine our HTTP request into one session. That is to make sure we carry the same view state which will make our exploit successful. Going back to our code, we will initialize a session object and use that for succeeding requests. The view state generator is the only static part, so let's slap the value. Let's put some spaces between the variable and value so it's not hard to read. Now let's import the Python RE module, which will allow us to do regular expression searches on the HTML page. Let's start looking for view state and store the value inside a variable. We will search inside the text attribute, which contains the HTML page. Let's use the match method of RE module. Let's specify the regular expression we want to match. Then we need to make sure it will get all possible values as indicated by dot and plus sign. Let's do a quick check first by firing the script. Don't be afraid, I know what that output means. It means Python wasn't able to see a match, so it returned a none object. Let's go back to our regular expression. The match method looks for pattern at the start of string. In this case, the pattern we are looking for is somewhere near the end. In order to fix this, we can use find all method to search anywhere in the line. So let's do a quick modification and fire up again. This time it's successful. Now that we know our regular expression works, the next thing we need to do is to extract the actual base64 encoded string. The next steps will be a series of Python string manipulation, so I will try my best to illustrate it so everyone can follow along. Let's get the first item in the list. Split it via the equal sign to turn into a list containing three items. Get the last item on the list. Strip the quotes at the start and end. And there you go, we have the value for our view state. We will do the same for event validation. Sorry, I forgot to record the video when I'm doing more changes. I encountered another issue with the view state, so I modified it. I passed the view state values together with the button element to the post request. Now let's fire up again and see if we can upload a shell. Finally, we uploaded a shell using our script. The next thing we need to do is to open a listener and trigger that shell. We will use a third party library, which is Pawn Tools. Let's jump back to the terminal and install Pawn Tools. We can use pip to install this on our home directory. That's easy. Let's import it to our script. Let's import all functions from the module. We need to make sure we start our listener first before everything else. And let's define the full path to our shell. Lastly, we need to send an HTTP get to that shell. We don't need to carry any view state at this point as the shell can be triggered by anyone randomly, so I will just create a standard HTTP call. Then after we send our HTTP call, let's catch the listener and create an interactive shell. Let's try now to fire this up. Waiting for connections. And we got one. But I don't think our interactive session is successful. I'm trying to press different keys, but the prompt is not showing up. Let's check what went wrong. When troubleshooting code issues, one way of finding the root cause is by breaking down the program into several pieces to isolate the issue. In our case, let's move our listener code to another file. Let's comment it out from the main script and create a new file. Same process, shebang on the first line and our code below. Let's run this in the background and fire up the main script again. It looks like it crashed, but I see that we received the connection. The error shows that there is a null object encountered. I suspect there is a timing issue between initial callback and the next instructions. So let's edit our script and try to wait for connection. Let's save that and run. I'll fire up the main script in the background. This time we had a prompt. Let's run some commands. There is still something wrong. It just returns the command we run and not the actual output. I did a bit of digging and found out that this is because we are not setting the new line context to carriage return and line feed. If you remember on the last video, we discussed that Windows systems treat end of line differently than Unix systems. So adding the new line context to the script successfully gave us a proper prompt. 
Now, since we verify that our lister code is working correctly, we can now add this back to the main script. Back to the main script, let's add the new line context and the method to wait for connection. Our script is becoming messy, so let's put some comments. Then let's fire up the script again. It's waiting for connection, but it seems it is not executing the next instructions. Luckily, I also have good experience with troubleshooting networking and low-level stuffs. The basic unit of instruction that runs on a processor are threads. Typically, different parts of a program can run on separate threads that run concurrently. On a low level, these threads are converted into instructions that can be understood by the CPU. In our case, our program appeared to be single-threaded, which means the instructions after the listener never started because it is blocking them. In order to fix that, we need to run them into separate threads so they don't block each other. We will use the Python threading module to run separate sections of our program in different threads. As a prerequisite, we need to convert the sections into functions because they will be passed on to the thread object. Let's not forget to import the threading module. Now that the functions are ready, we can start creating two thread objects. First one is a thread for uploading the shell and triggering it. Second thread will be for launching our listener and catching the connection. Now, let's fire it. Finally, we did it. Let's try running some commands. Output looks good and no line feed issues. If you reached this part of the video, I want to thank you for staying with me. Although we encountered different issues, we were able to create a successful exploit and learned a lot of different concepts. If you find this video valuable, please like and share so it can help others as well. Next video will be exciting as we will exploit our way to local admin on Castle Black, so stay tuned. See you on the next one.